We're here at the Primer Animal Care and Use Committee Conference, and I have the very distinct privilege of sitting down with Taylor Bennett, who is someone who truly has seen it all, done it all, led it all, impacted it all, and so this is a particular thrill, not just for me, but for those who will watch this interview um, hereafter. So Taylor, would you please identify yourself and then we will start our conversation. Yeah, I'm Taylor Bennett. I'm uh, currently a management consultant and have been for the last six years and serving as a senior scientific advisor for the National Association for Biomedical Research. So you and I have had limited conversation over the years about your growing up <laughs> years. And I know that your family was a family of science guys. Um, would you tell me a bit about your background and what it was in that background that first introduced you to and interested you in a career in science? Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, my, my father was a second generation physician from a small town in West Tennessee who uh, had a double residency in neurology and psychiatry and in World War II was stationed in North Carolina and met my mother who was from Vermont and was a nurse in the uh, military. And so I'm kind of a hybrid. <laughs> uh, and my, at the t once they got out of the military, I, my remembrance of being around medical stuff was when he was uh, uh, medical director of Highland Hospital, which was Duke Psychiatric Hospital. And uh, at the time, one of his patients was F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife in, in the book Zelda. Uh, about her, there was a big fire there where uh, some patients were killed and everything. So, my father elected to leave that part of medicine and become the head of psychiatry, chief of psychiatry at the VA in Nashville, Tennessee. So we moved there when I was four, and we lived out on the on the base there. It was the old military barracks type thing. And our uh, housing unit happened to be right next door to the guinea pig house. <laughs> so at the age of six. <laughs> I started helping the guy in the guinea pig house. Uh, sometimes he'd actually give me money, which I probably wasn't even supposed to be in there. And then I got more interested in just science. And uh, my junior year of high school, I applied for a uh, government program where you could work in uh, a scientific uh, uh, setup. And I ended up working as an animal care technician and surgical technician in the research facility there at the VA. And I was working with a couple of physicians. One was named Dr. Zukowski. He was doing all the original kidney transplant work. And uh, what he told me was that we didn't need any more MDs. We needed more veterinarians involved in this. And I'd always, I'd worked in the summers on my uh, uncle's farm over in West Tennessee. And then my father's nickname was Zoo. And it was because growing up, apparently, he had a menagerie of snakes and everything else that drove people in the little town crazy. But so I'd always worked around animals all my life, and so I thought that would be a good thing. So I broke the mold and went to vet school instead of medical school, and the rest is sort of history. <laughs> uh, and then after veterinary school, went into a knew I wanted to do re be involved in research, and so uh, I went up, moved from Auburn to. Uh, Chicago, Illinois into a training program there and ended up staying. So you knew you wanted to be in research, but I'd like to have those watching this interview have the benefit of what it was about research that first drew you to it. This was a, a relatively new field in those years. The NIH wasn't all that old and medical research was certainly exploding. How did you first become introduced to and again interested in research as your chosen field? Well, I, I grew up in a family where learning was just kind of a way of life and research is just, the nice thing about research is you're always learning. I think uh, when you quit learning you might as well pack it up and leave, but uh, I think that was the thing. My, um, my mother as a nurse, but she was also, she read about a lot of different things, but that was just kind of the way it was. Learning was uh, important in our family and uh, it was just an opportunity to learn more things I guess. Uh, not sure exactly why, it just sort of happened. <laughs> and he, I was exposed to a lot of it just because of my father's profession and everything so I think that made a big difference. So you moved to Chicago? Yep. Good old southern boy heads north? Yeah with a wife and four-year-old son in 1969. <laughs> and 
tell me about the early years of your career, and mostly I'm interested in hearing what the climate for biomedical research and the use of animals in science and research was like at the end of the 1960s. Well, and then we can talk about what you've seen and certainly had a very strong hand in over the intervening 40 some odd years. Well, I think uh, the program I was in was run by the VA, and it, uh, it, it had a component where the first year you uh, uh, did basically what would be lab animal medicine training, and then you were either uh, approved to go on for a, a master's or a PhD. Uh, I had some interesting experiences in that first year. One was on every Friday I would uh, take the train into uh, downtown Chicago and go to work at a place called the Biomedical Institute, which was the top two floors of the AMA headquarters. And one of the founding fathers of laboratory animal science uh, in uh, non-DVM, George Collins, was the manager there. And so this was a very interesting place in that uh, what the AMA had done was they hired a bunch of Nobel laureates and let them do research and gave them a big salary uh, with no strings attached. And so it was kind of interesting. Every day for lunch, we'd go down and eat lunch with all these very famous scientists and everything who were really very dependent upon what we did in that animal facility. And that was kind of interesting. Uh, Another interesting part of it is about a year later, uh, the IRS ruled that the uh, 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 advertising revenue <laughs> in the AMA Journal was not tax exempt, and guess what happened? <laughs> they closed the Biomedical Institute. Uh, I also spent time uh, three months out at Argonne, uh, where they were doing all the initial studies on the effect of radiation and, and working with a group of and the thing there was these animals were ex exposed to a limited amount, like normal people might be, and then maintained for life. So there was a very heavy veterinary component in maintaining these animals over life to see what the impact of radiation was. Then I, uh, when I was elected to go for a uh, PhD, there were several options there in Chicago. Uh, only one of them uh, didn't have a language requirement, and that's not one of my strong points. So I went and ended up at the University of Illinois. <laughs> And it was different then. It was different. Uh, there were a lot of animals. There was uh, varying degrees of support. I mean, it was Darwinian, really. It was, uh, but there was one of the things that was not, didn't seem to be a lot of approach to providing a research support service to the investigators. And so that's one of the things I thought I could do. In order to have an office, I had to be a clinical veterinarian while I was working on my PhD. And so, <laughs> Uh, we did a lot of different things, but uh, I think learning to, to convince investigators that if we manage the animals well, they get better data. And I learned that really early in my career, like in three weeks after I was there. And uh, uh, that's kind of the basis of my approach to life is uh, if you worry about the animal's welfare, the, the issue of compliance will take care of itself. Uh, so that was just kind of the approach. And we were just thrown in. It wasn't a mentored process. They just threw us in the water, and if you could swim, you swam. It was not like today, but things have changed a lot, too. One quick point of clarification. You mentioned there wasn't a lot of support. I assume you meant for the animal care program, but you also used the word it was Darwinian, and I wasn't sure whether you meant Darwinian for the animals, only the strongest survived, or for the the vets and other animals. Both. Animal staff. I think okay. it was everybody. I okay. think by that I mean at that at that point in time, uh, when monkeys were brought in, it was not unusual to have a whole shipment of monkeys with TB. Yeah. Uh, uh, most of the, there weren't purpose-bred breeders for dogs and cats. They came out of pounds and, and it, you know, what was, you know, we saw diseases, it was, it's like in a military base where you bring all these people together and then diseases run rampant, so you were dealing with that all the time. Uh, you know, any, it was, it was, uh, we did the quality, one of the biggest changes in this business has been the quality of the animals. And as the quality of the animals improved, the quality of the data improved, so it was, uh, uh, everybody was learning their way. Um, having veterinarians there to help was new to a lot of people. And uh, so you, it was a learning process. Uh, I don't know, and we made a lot of mistakes. 
And, but uh, as I used to tell my postdocs, you don't remember one single question verbatim that you got right, but you remember a lot of them you got wrong. So I remember a lot of things I got wrong first out of the box. Uh, and unfortunately, we're in an environment today where you can't make a mistake because if you make a mistake, uh, you got to report it and you can get written up for it. And uh, uh, a lot of people learn by making mistakes. And if you just minimize the harm that a mistake does, then uh, they can be significant learning experiences. Yeah. So you've raised so many important points in our already less than 10 short minutes together, but one I want to return to briefly um, is your comment that you learned early on, and forgive me if I'm mischaracterizing what you said, but I believe you said you learned early on that treating the animals well and making sure that they're well cared for will yield or provide better data for the researchers. And I want to know how it was you learned that because that's still a sticking point, it seems, among some researchers. And they still haven't quite understood that, you know, good welfare equals good science. And so what were the influences? Were they just watching your parents and your grandfather? Was it something you learned in college or vet school? Or was it, you know, your hard wiring and DNA that led you to understand early on about ethical care and use, responsible use, welfare issues? Again, that doesn't come naturally to everyone in this field. Well, I think part of it is that uh, at the time, when I went to veterinary school, there, there was only two in the South. And uh, from Tennessee, 15 people a year could go to vet school. And so you had to bring to the table some significant animal experience. And, and working with my uncle on the farm, and he was a VOAG teacher, vocational agriculture teacher, he taught me the importance of good husbandry, good stockmanship. You know, if you don't take care of your animals, your animals won't take care of you. So I learned that a little bit. And then uh, in veterinary school, uh, uh, the, our, the first day of we were there, we had an orientation by who the gentleman who happened to be our anatomy professor, and he said there are only three service organizations, medicine, law, and theology, and veterinary medicine is a service, and so you need to provide service. So if you bring a, a client service mentality to working in a research facility uh, in terms of the animals and, and work with them as clients, then uh, you have a little bit different attitude, I think. Uh, and the other vets that were there, at that time, there were there were three of us that went down there to the Illinois at the time. Uh, we'd all come out of an environment where service was important, and I learned about service not through medicine, but when I found out I would starve to death working for veterinarians while I was going to school, I went back to what I was doing before I worked for veterinarians, and I was driving a truck for my a friend of the family's who's a Texaco jobber, and. Uh, his idea was service. He didn't care whether you were dropping 9,500 gallons of gas or 50 gallons of fuel oil at some trailer. Everybody got service. And so I thought he, I learned a lot from that. But the thing that I learned about providing service, there was a, they were using dog models back then. And it's an old standard surgical procedure looking at trying to learn more about GI physiology. And so they put these cannulas in and you may want to edit this out. They put these cannulas in and they collect gastric fluid. And uh, when I got there, they were doing this and they were using these balloons to collect the gastric fluid and they would break and the acid would get on the dogs and, and, and they get a little irritation and things weren't going well. And so I started talking to the investigator and there's two things that I happen to know about. One, because I changed enough diapers at that point in my life, I knew about zinc oxide prevents diaper rash if you put some of that around the cannula. And the other was that there's something that's a lot stronger than a balloon. And that's a prophylactic because we sold a ton of those things as tires, batteries, and accessories to these filling stations. <laughs> and so we changed over from using balloons to using prophylactics and surrounding them, and the study took off. And so all of a sudden, I became the go-to guy at this huge institution for providing service and helping people with that. But it was all common sense. It was just nobody bothered to sit down and look at what the issues were. And a lot of that may have been they were just too busy. I mean, you know, when you've got thousands of animals, some of which coming in in this condition, some of them came into, sometimes it was just hard to stay on top of stuff. Uh, uh, so it was a, that was a fun time, though. 
everybody came to the guy with the prophylactics, and I was going, oh, God. <laughs> So I made my life. No, never mind. <laughs> well, let the record reflect that one of the people with the most common sense of anyone I know, Taylor Bennett, has <laughs> thankfully acknowledged that he is the go-to guy for problem-solving, ingenuity. No, no it was, I just happened to be the only one there at the time. <laughs> so who you are. So there are four flashpoints among many that have really been enduring problems, or at least issues and likely problems as well, throughout my time in this field, which ne is not nearly as long as yours. But I'd like to mention each and to have you talk about what the state of the art or science was in 69 or thereabouts and what changes have been made. Mm -hmm. And do it as quickly as you like or you know as slowly as you like. But the four areas are housing, environmental enrichment, pain and distress and humane endpoints or endpoints. And I'd like you to talk about what you found when you first entered the, the animal research field, the biomedical research field, and the conditions of, again, caging, enrichment, pain, and, um, and endpoints. And what progress and or, what progresses were made and or what challenges still remain? Well, in some respect, I was pretty fortunate. The, uh, facility at the University of uh, Illinois Chicago was one of the first centralized facilities in the country. Uh, there was a veterinarian there who designed that name, Bill Dalloway, who uh, then moved on into something else, but that, that facility had been enlarged and, and so we had uh, pen housing of dogs, we had a lot of things that a lot of other facilities didn't have in terms of housing. The original cubicle, which is called the Illinois cubicle, was in the facility that I mean, I trained in and then ran for from 1974 to 206, so uh, a little while. Uh, so I think the caging issue uh, was uh, not as big a issue as some of the other things. I uh, I had my own likes and dislikes. I, I, I never liked dogs in cages. I wanted them on the floor. And I, I didn't want them on a wet floor. I wanted bedding and this type of stuff. Um, primates were a different issue. Uh, the primate caging, uh, and most people, as I understand the primate caging, the original primate cage came from a uh, cage used to house turkeys. And th the measurement for that cage was because stainless steel came in three foot rolls. It had nothing to do with any, and there's never been a lot of science applied to the, the types of cages we use anyway. Um, as far as uh, the pain and distress issue, I was also fortunate in we had a large central surgery and we managed the surgery on all of the covered species. Uh, it was all done in one area uh, and with vet techs. We had a lot, we didn't have, at first we didn't have vet techs because there weren't vet techs. Uh, we had some uh, uh, surgical techs, a couple of young ladies who'd started nursing school and quit and eventually we moved over to vert, vet techs. And, uh, I, I will take credit for having enough sense to empower them to let them run the show. Uh, uh, but so that, I think that's a different thing. I, it's much harder to manage these issues when they're spread out all over a campus as opposed to when they're in one place. Uh, the other thing is that if, if you make all that part of providing a service, it's a lot easier to sell to people. If they know you're going to take care of it and they don't have to worry about it. Uh, and that's kind of the way we did it. Uh, I didn't in nickel and dime investigators to death. You know, you can roll something into a, uh, their daily per diem and they never know it's there and you just provide it. So uh, uh, that was kind of our approach. Uh, the endpoint issue was a, uh, it's still an issue. Uh, there was a very interesting comment made yesterday during that first presentation about the difference between scientific endpoints and humane endpoints and how we'd really like. Uh, to be able to reach the scientific endpoint before you ever have to consider the humane endpoint. Um, I think that has evolved and I don't think it has anything to do with, uh, well, it has something to do, but it, investigators want the cleanest, best data they can get. And uh, pain and distress does compromises their data. So they are pushing, always pushing to get better data. And so I think that had a lot to do with the issue of being able to sell endpoints and to work with people. Uh, 
there was a comment, there was a little bit of controversy in a couple of the presentations over this recent report by the IOM on chimpanzee research. And one of the things I don't think has been handled very well through this whole deal, because everybody wants it to say whatever it is they want it to say to meet their own selfish self-interest, is the reason the chimps are not going to be needed anymore is because the scientific community developed alternatives to the chimpanzee because it was better science. And uh, I haven't seen that said much, but that's actually, if you read between the lines in the report, that's what it says. In fact, um, the chair of that committee has an article in the New Hastings Center publication on animal ethics issues in which he basically comes out and says that the scientific community drove the changes which have resulted in the decline of the use of chimps. Uh, enrichment's another issue. Uh, I uh, was, I had a young woman come to me who was, uh, I, I also, one of the things I did while I was at the university is I sponsored the pre-vet club. And University of Illinois at Chicago is a urban university, the most diverse university, I think, in the country uh, at the level as a research one institution. And so we got a lot of people coming back for career change degrees, uh, in, and they were not, we had pastry chefs at our uh, pre-vet club, which was really good during parties and stuff, uh, lawyers, and this one young woman who was interested in animal behavior and so she wanted to come see me, and so I thought, we need to start looking at this stuff. And so she started developing some enrichment for baboons. And we, uh, outside Southwest Foundation, we house more baboons than anybody in the country. And uh, just simple little stuff, uh, foraging and uh, uh, monitoring behavior. Uh, uh, and the whole enrichment thing has really uh, exploded. The problem with the enrichment thing in its explosion is is that laboratory animal science has limited ways to publish data and even less ways to confirm data. It's not like the biomedical community. There's only a few journals. And people publish stuff. We've, many of our colleagues, veterinarians and laboratory have become experts on behavior with no formal training in behavior. And so there's a lot of stuff out there in the literature and people just want to jump in and enrich the environment of the animals without any consideration as to how that might impact the science. And so to some degree, this, this blind push for, uh, without some science, push for enrichment has again created kind of a schism between the research community and the animal care community because they don't know what it's going to do to their data. And if you've got, been doing the same model for years and years and years, and one of the speakers we've had here, Melinda Novak, who's done a lot of the work on primate behavior and enrichment, has pointed out on many occasions that monkeys aren't rats and that all of the enrichment data that's been done up to date, uh, not up now, but at that time, in rodents was looking at the effect of enriched environments on development of the brain and not on what happens when you enrich the environment for something that's not raised in an enriched environment, <laughs> which can create some problems. Uh, I liken it to if you grew up in New York City and all of a sudden got transferred to Wyoming, you go crazy, and vice versa. <laughs> so uh, enrichment has to be taken into the context of how the animal was raised, how what the animal is being used, and, and a degree of common sense sometimes which is not liberally sprinkled around through our community. Uh, so I think that's a thing. I think we're still learning. Uh, Bill White, the group at Charles River, uh, is probably one of the best groups I've seen. I mean, they really take a scientific approach to this, and he's got a staff of young veterinarians and people that are really good in the enrichment area, and they're publishing these little booklets. So I think that's still a story that we haven't sorted out yet. Uh, but we need to be careful when we jump in that we know how to swim. <laughs> you just educated me because I just thought rah rah and Richmond. And I saw the slide yesterday where they showed the rats, you know, brain but that, pre and post enrichment. But that was a developmental issue. I saw that. And, saw that. and the whole issue here was, and they used, they also looked at that, uh, some of that work was done in post stroke models where the enriched environment. But, the problem is you, you can't take research data used for something entirely different and just uniformly apply it without 
trying to understand what the data is all about. And there are a lot of people, you know, just throw something in the cage. Well, you got five mice in there and you throw something in the cage. It's like throwing one candy bar into a, a room full of kids. One kid's going to be enriched. <laughs> the rest of them are going to be madder than hell. <laughs> so you you have to look at this, and there's, uh, that's. Uh, I think it. Everybody was doing this with the right spirit in mind, but we every once in a while uh, we need to step back. I, my PhD advisor used to always ask these questions: Does this make biological sense to you? And I used to drive my postdocs nuts with that. Does this make biological sense to you? And that's a question we don't ask often enough. Uh, unfortunately, we just do it. So Taylor, I could not count the number of hats you've worn in this room <laughs> and worn well. But uh, at least they include clinical veterinarian, attending vet, uh, researcher, director of a major and highly respected lab animal facility, prolific writer, policy developer on several federal regulatory committees, advocate, media spokesperson, including yeah. Oprah Winfrey with Ingrid Newkirk. <laughs> well, Ingrid, Ingrid was there, but Oprah wasn't. It was Marilyn uh, McCoo from uh, the Fifth Dimension, and she was not very happy at all about having to be the host for this session. She was scared to death of what was going to happen. We will definitely come back to that. <laughs> um, and, and you have been a very, very involved uh, leader in the community in general, and owing to that post, you've been a broker among several different groups with diverse and disparate opinions. And so with this incredibly unique variety of perspectives and a variety of dimensions to your professional career, I'd like you, for the record, as someone who has seen it all and done it all, to summarize two things for me and again for the viewers. One, I'd love you to summarize the history of the regulatory structure and apparatus for research with animals, starting with the Animal Welfare Act, which okay. just predated your entry into the field. And then I'd love you to talk a bit about the main publications, several of which you had a main hand in. So those two domains, the regulatory domain and the written resources and guides that accompany, or at least are companions to those regulations. Well, actually, uh, I was when I went to veterinary school, I was the only one in the class that was interested in research. And uh, we had an instructor who had come out of the military. He'd actually been a public health veterinarian, a very high-ranking public health veterinarian, uh, who started a course in laboratory animal medicine there. And uh, I actually have in my files an original copy of the Animal Welfare Act and the first set of regs, because we studied them as part of our lab animal course. Uh, in 1966. So uh, I've been uh, dealing with the uh, Animal Welfare Act longer than anybody in the USDA, that's for sure. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I've just done a uh, put together a talk for the ACLAM Forum in which I went back and looked through the Animal Welfare Act, the Public Health Service Policy, and all the copies of the guide back to 1963 to try to define the uh, the environment and the evolutionary process that has led to where attending veterinarians are today, which is kind of an interesting thing. So the first, you know, when the Animal Welfare Act first was passed, it only affected institutions that which housed dogs and cats or non-human primates. And then it was amended and then it was amended, but it... Could you give years, please? Okay, it was amended in 1970. It was first passed in 66. 66, and then it was amended in 1970, again in the 76, and then the big amendment, which made all the changes with IACUCs and everything and which dovetailed with the changes in the public health service policy was 1985. But I think what's important about those dates is that it was while the animal, the amendment to the Animal Welfare Act 1985, which included the exercise for dogs requirements, uh, actually significantly changed the, uh, the definition of an attending veterinarian and the uh, resources that an institution had to provide for adequate veterinary care, uh, as well as the eye cook and the enrichment, was that it took four years, almost six years, six years for some, but four years for the, the main regulations to get through the uh, regulatory process. 
during that same period of time, the public health service immediately could implement their policy, which fairly was relatively identical, other than uh, reporting lines and number of people on the committee to the Animal Welfare Act. So the community had a four-year period to learn and to grow and to refine before they ever got inspected by the USDA. And I think this was very important because uh, learning processes are generally not amenable to close regulatory scrutiny, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, so we learned uh, with little pressure because the uh, at that time it was OPRR was a whole different ball game than it is today. And then for the first two or three years after the animal welfare regulations came into play, the VMOs from USDA were learning, you know, what this was all about. And so we had a long period of time to kind of get our act together before uh, regulatory scrutiny. And I think that was a big thing. I think the other thing that was very helpful back then was OPR had these roving workshops, and I happen to be a faculty on a lot of those workshops, uh, going around the country and people learn together. And that's something Prim and R does is you get people in a room and they realize that whatever problems they're having are really not that unique. <laughs> that somebody else is sharing your same concerns. And I mean that's one of the things I, I think the uh, particularly Prim and R does, SCA does with their type of breakout sessions too, is they let people uh, learn from others, from their peers, and I think if you realize that uh, my problems are the same, you know, you're not unique, it makes it a little bit easier to go home and, and deal with the issues. But that's kind of the environment in which that grew up. At the time, in 1980 or 81, uh, the graduate students came to me about wanting a course on uh, animal rights and other issues involving animal, because the animal rights movement was starting to ratchet up. Uh, they were seeing stuff at their, when they'd go to meetings, the FACIPs and wherever the graduate students go to meetings, and were feeling pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, people don't go into biomedical research to get rich and famous, and they're generally uh, pretty liberal, uh, think they're doing the right thing for the right reasons. and when they're being called Nazis and torturers and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's particularly the young kids, it's hard on them. And most of their advisors didn't know anything about this, so they couldn't help them. So we started this course. And it started as seminars, and then it became Essentials for Animal Research, which right after the regs passed, I had, I think, the first grant that AWIC ever gave to write a thing called Essentials for Animal Research, a primer for investigators, which I've learned since is their most distributed version, a thing they've ever published. But it, it just came out of this course, and it was because graduate students wanted to learn. And over the years, it became, a, within about three years, well, as soon as the, the regs came in, or even before then, it became a required course of all graduate students who used animals in their thesis or dissertation research. And so, uh, and they're still teaching it. And we learned, we got into the graduate students and we began to, they, we could tell when a graduate student had taken the course by the quality of the protocols that came out of the lab that they were working in. Because you, you do not teach old dogs new tricks, but if you catch the puppies, <laughs> and we, so we decided we'd train the next generation. And that was our approach to ed educating people at our institution. And every year we'd have oh, 60, 65, students that were in the lecture. And one of the things that we tried to teach them was that the veterinarians are your friends. We had a, always had an open door policy. Uh, and, you know, if you have anything, you come in to see us, blah, blah, blah. And I think that made a big difference uh, to a whole generation of scientists. And one of the things that a couple of times I've mentioned in our planning committee meetings that let's don't make the scientists the bad guy, folks. <laughs> uh, because Today, almost every major investigator at any institution has grown up in this system. Uh, and when you have a, a situation where one of these, where you have a problematic personality or whatever, it's not the eye cook. They're not the only ones having the problem. You can go to personnel, you can go to 
to <laughs> ordering, you can go to environment. It's the same, it's like, you know, 5% of the people cause 95% of the problem. So it's not an issue of compliance. We aren't in a we, they environment. And one of the things I'm glad to see in the new guide is um, they lay out some policy, well, the guide is recommendations, in spite of what Ola might want to say, that it's, <laughs> it's everything has to be done a certain way on things, is that we are here, they list the things we should do, but the purpose of that is to uh, foster good science and assure animal welfare. And uh, that's a big change in the way the guy approaches things. And that's always been our approach was that if you facilitate, you can facilitate, I, I cooks, veterinarians have two jobs, compliance and facilitate research. Because if there's no research, we don't need I cooks and we sure as hell don't need veterinarians. So, uh, uh, but animal welfare is the big issue and that's what Russell and Birch's book was all about. Uh, so again, for just purposes of completeness, you've talked about the Animal Welfare Act of six, 1966 and the assorted amendments. You've talked about the regulations of 1985. And did you talk about the, the original version of the guide to the care and use set? Well, it's I mean, interesting. You talked about your guide and essentials. But well, the, the guide, mentioned... I actually have all those copies in my file, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I was actually reading through them. It's kind of interesting to watch the evolution of the guide over a period of time. When was the first one? 1963. And then there were a whole bunch of them after that. It was actually initially just a guide for the facilities part of it, and it eventually became a program type thing. And then it was in 19, was it, 85, 86, that version of the guide was the one where institutional responsibility kind of came to the forefront. After that, before that, it had been you know, what institutional responsibility. But what people don't realize is uh, starting in the early 70s, the guide, rec rec the first version they came out with, I believe it was 72, um, recommended that you have a committee in place to oversee. That was one way to improve things. So this, the issue of committees and this type of thing had been around for a long time. And it was a three-person committee. The public health service policy uh, which started in 1971 and was amended again in 78 or 79, was amended once sooner than that, but towards the end. It also had this committee and it became a five-person committee towards the end of the 70s and then the major revision took place in 1985 and that was after uh, they went out and looked at a cross-section of institutions and how the policy was working because a letter of assurance used to be a one-page document. That's all it was, is a one-page document. Eh. Now, now it's reams. <laughs> uh, so it was kind of interesting to watch that evolve. But at our institution, we had a we started a committee because the guide required you have this committee. And uh, uh, I talked that committee into allowing us to require, from a business standpoint, uh, investigators to fill out a two or three page form so that we could provide them better service. And then, so it was very easy when the things started coming in to just keep adding another layer on and people got used to it. But uh, um, if you don't know what they're doing, you can't provide good service. So, uh, and they didn't seem to object to that. You know, nobody was holding their feet to the fire. So thank you for outlining the main regulatory structure in this country. And for now, I think, unless you'd like to make reference to the international, we'll move on. But well, the international thing is very interesting. Then please. And uh, I was actually was participated in a meeting a few years ago in England on this. And uh, our system is different. And part of that is, is I, though I don't know this to be totally factual, but my guess is the top five funded research facilities in the U.S. have more animals than the entire United Kingdom in their research program. So that's why the systems are different. And the United Kingdom is the one through their home office that's held up to be the uh, the shining light the way it should be done which and actually my presentation was I was trying to point out why the US system was better than theirs without getting thrown out of England but uh, there's a significant difference between the rest of the world and here and that is the authority given the veterinarian with it since the 1985 amendment in terms of uh, managing the animal care and use program. Uh, the European uh, new directive puts the veterinarian in an advisory role and not in an authority role. And I think that's a huge difference in terms of 
uh, how we manage animals. Uh, is that the veterinarian has a, a big role. Many programs that when, when we had a full complement of postdocs, we had, you know, 9, 10, 12 veterinarians involved in the program and they were out there working with the investigators. Uh, you'll have one veterinarian who's advisory to a big program in Europe. So that's the huge difference, I think, between the two. And the other difference is, I think, in something I was involved with, is our ability to comment during the uh, rulemaking process. And major changes were made with, in the proposed rule uh, because, you know, science should drive sound public policy and where the science isn't there. We need to be careful what we require people to do. Uh, uh, having regulations that uh, serve no purpose other than to generate paperwork rather than aff affect animal welfare is something that I have worked relatively hard in my life to <laughs> make sure it didn't get implemented. <laughs> we don't have time to deal with paperwork. Let's take care of the animals.